It's nearly Halloween, and one of the most popular costumes you'll see walking the streets this October 31st is the witch. That's probably because it's also one of the simplest. Wear something black, grab a broomstick, don a pointy hat, and maybe a mask, and you've got an instantly recognizable classic. Most people today are aware of at least some of the real history of witches, with the witch trials of colonial America cast in the longest shadow. That's not the only part of traditional witch lore that has a dark history. The history of witches is largely rooted in misogyny and other unpleasantness, and while I won't be going too deep into the general history of witches, some of today's topics invariably overlap with unflattering portrayals of marginalized people, many of which are still with us today. If you need proof of that, consider how the female witch is usually seen as nefarious and evil, while the male wizard is typically wise and revered. So, if you're ready, let the witching hour begin. Or at least the witching next nine minutes or so. If you're going for a quick and easy Halloween costume, all you really need to be recognized as the witch is a pointy black hat. So where does that come from? There are two prevailing theories. The Fourth Lateran Council, held in 1215, ordained that Jews and Muslims living in Christian lands had to wear distinctive headgear. The reason? So that good Christians wouldn't accidentally have sex with them. Really. In some provinces, a difference in dress distinguishes the Jews or Saracens from the Christians, but in certain others, such a confusion has grown up that they cannot be distinguished by any difference. Thus it happens at times that, through error, Christians have relations with the women of Jews or Saracens, and Jews and Saracens with Christian women. Therefore, that they may not, under pretext of error of this sort, excuse themselves in the future for the excesses of such prohibited intercourse, we decree that such Jews and Saracens of both sexes, in every Christian province, and at all times, shall be marked off in the eyes of the public from other peoples through the character of their dress. For Jews, that distinguishing dress was the Judenhut, a kind of pointed hat, which many had willingly worn in earlier times but were now forced to wear. Anti-Semitic views associated Jews with black magic and other types of sorcery and devilry, and so it's possible that the conical hat carried that association forward to witches. Though the lack of depictions of female Jews wearing pointed hats, and the various styles of Judenhuts worn in different regions, might make all of that a bunch of schlock. Jews were expelled from England in 1290, though they were permitted to return in 1656, which was about the same time that the Society of Friends, or Quakers, emerged. Wide brim hats with cut off conical sections were common dress for the era, and many men and women wore them in those times. The Quakers had some mind blowing radical ideas for 17th century England, most notably, a much greater level of equality between men and women than was typical for the times. Quaker women took on roles traditionally reserved for men alone, such as preaching and having a voice at community affairs. As strong willed women were often equated with witches, Quaker women wearing the traditional hat while conducting their business may have led to their identification as witches possibly with some lingering anti-Semitism from Judenhuts as an influence. Quaker women were often depicted as wearing the hat well after it went out of fashion, further portraying them as outsiders and nonconformists, also popular labels typically applied to witches. Like many exaggerated features of monsters, the cut-off conical hat may have been expanded all the way up to a point, leading to the witch hat as we know it today. By the way, Quaker men were also accused of sorcery and other unholy acts, and there was even a ballad about a Quaker man having sex with a horse while the devil watches, and... Well, maybe I'll cover centaurs in a future video. The first visual depiction of a witch flying on a broomstick comes from the 15th century French manuscript The Defender of Ladies. Two illustrations from that book show women flying on sticks, one clearly a broom and the other just a simple pole. Another witch was accused of pole riding a century earlier. In 1324, Alice Keitler was said to have a pipe of ointment wherewith she greased a staff upon which she ambled and galloped through thick and thin, when and in what manner she listed. Witches and witchcraft had been considered real for millennia by this time, but granting them this means of locomotion made it easier to account for their sinful gatherings, known as a witch's sabbat, which was a relatively new invention at the time. Broomsticks weren't the only way witches could fly. Some accounts had them whizzing around on chairs, while others said that witches only thought they could fly, due to the devil's trickery. That may have been due to hallucinogenic elements found in ointments, like the one purportedly used by Alice Keitler, though there is debate as to whether such ointments were thought by the witches themselves to grant them flying powers, or were simply an explanation given by their accusers, some of which referred to women applying the ointment to their hairy places. It doesn't take much of a leap to understand how women applying lubricant to hairy places and riding a pole was, shall we say, frowned upon by the medieval church. 
Witches were perceived as being promiscuous, notably that they had sex with the devil, and women in general were thought to be easily swayed by their sexual appetites. Quaker women, mentioned in the previous section, were especially thought to be like this, as they were more sexually liberated than they supposedly had a right to be in their time. Nobody accused of witchcraft ever confessed to directly using a broom for sexual purposes, but the connotation still stuck. Though it should be noted that the first person to confess to flying on a broomstick to meet with the devil was a man, Guillaume Edelin, in 1453. Overall, there are many ways to link broomsticks to flying witches, though given the witch hysteria of the late Middle Ages and early Renaissance, it's difficult to say what came from accusations and what came from testimony by the witches themselves. Consider also that many witches only confessed under torture, or were fed leading questions that were designed to give their accusers the answers they wanted to hear. It's most likely that brooms were simply a common tool used by the kinds of lower class women who were often accused of witchcraft, and they made for an easy target for inquisitors and witch hunters. Ancient Egyptians held cats as sacred, and it was connections to ancient faiths like this, as well as the heresies of its day, that the medieval church was desperate to stamp out. In 1233, Pope Gregory IX issued Vox and Rama, a papal bull condemning heresy and devil worship that detailed the initiation rites of a sect of such heathens. These rites supposedly included a statue of a black cat coming to life, whose rear end initiates would have to kiss. Then they would all have a big orgy, after which Lucifer would appear as a half-man, half-cat hybrid. Sounds like a fun time. A recent book claims that the missive led to a virtual crusade against cats in Christian lands, but Vox and Rama had a very limited distribution, only being sent out to five prominent men, and it didn't specifically sanction cat or even witch hunts. But cats were, and still are, considered more than a little mysterious and cunning, not to mention being remarkably free-willed and independent, all labels that you could apply to witches of the late medieval period. So it's possible that Pope Gregory was channeling some popular superstitions of his time when he wrote about the devilish cats in Vox and Rama, and some elements of that filtered down to the lore of witches. And black being the cover of, well, darkness, meant that black cats were more likely to be seen as servants of evil than cats of other colors. By the way, another myth sometimes associated with Vox and Rama is that because cats were vilified as servants of Lucifer, they were slaughtered in great numbers and the Black Death was more severe than it should have been owing to the lack of cats as rat hunters. This has been widely debunked, both because there's no evidence of mass cat killings, and because the plague infested fleas found on rats could just as easily be transferred to the cats that hunted them. Now that we've covered several parts of the traditional witch's kit, let's take a look at the witch herself, notably her face. The modern image of the green-skinned, pointy-nosed witch is commonly attributed to Margaret Hamilton's appearance as the Wicked Witch of the West in the 1939 film adaptation of The Wizard of Oz. This is partially accurate. In L. Frank Baum's novel, no mention is made of the witch's skin color. Rather, being one of the first movies to use Technicolor, the film studio wanted to use as much vivid color as possible. That's why Dorothy's slippers went from silver in the book to ruby in the movie, and why the witch's skin took on a bright green tone. Compare her with the Wicked Witch of Disney's Snow White, released two years earlier, who has a more natural skin tone. The reasons for the other common elements of the witch's face aren't so pretty, and I'm not referring to her appearance itself. Like the hat, the long hooked nose is another callback to anti-Semitic portrayals of Jews, who are stereotypically portrayed as having oversized noses. Also, the notion that witches eat children, like in the story of Hansel and Gretel, or use their blood for magic spells like in the tale of Rapunzel, has parallels to the blood libel, an anti-Semitic myth that accused Jews of kidnapping children for similar purposes. Women of all ages were accused of witchcraft, and yet the old woman witch trope is dominant. For the most part, this can be chalked up to simple ageism. Older women were seen as less appealing or useful to society, since they could no longer bear children, so they were shunted into roles like midwives or healers, making them prime targets for witchcraft accusations if a disease or other kind of malady was running rampant. Their lack of sexual appeal as they aged also led to accusations that they were jealous of younger women and sought to ensorcel them or their men, or when all else failed, have sex with the devil. As for the ubiquitous wart, that was often seen as the devil's mark, a feature on the body that proved someone was a witch, and that devilish creatures might suckle at like a mother's teeth. All in all, the various facial features that make up the witch today tend to have some pretty atrocious history behind them. If you plan to dress up as a witch this year for Halloween, maybe leave the mask or makeup behind. Witches as a whole are viewed with less prejudice today, thanks to real-life movements like Wicca, as well as more positive representations in media, which tend to portray witches as just female spellcasters, equally likely to work for good as they are for evil. Even when they don the hat, or ride a broom, or keep a black cat as a pet, they're seen as generally harmless or even benevolent. While we shouldn't forget the unpleasantness that spawned many of these accessories, 
It's nice to think that they've largely been replaced by a sense of whimsy and innocent fun. We can only hope that all our symbols of hatred and prejudice might one day meet with a similar fate. Thank you so much for watching this video about the common origins of several witchy myths. Please like and subscribe if you enjoyed it, and leave me a comment letting me know what you thought or to suggest a topic for a future video. Until next time, may all your spells come off without a witch. I mean, a hitch.